Okay, hi everybody, this is a quick video of a demonstration to determine the moment of inertia of a rigid disc using the air bearing table. And there's an air bearing table there. And why is it called an air bearing table? Because you blow air through it to get rid of the friction. At the moment, there's no air, and so that disc is not spinning. But, let's turn the air on, and, lo and behold, constant angular velocity. And what we want to do today is, we want to work out what the moment of inertia of that disc is. And we're going to do that by attaching a little pulley to it, and then applying a torque to it, and measuring its angular acceleration. So we've got about a metre and a half of string wound around that pulley, and we're going to pull that out, and we're going to attach to the end of it a mass of a hundred grams. So I've pulled the string out and it's hanging over another little wheel and then we've attached the hundred gram mass that's hanging freely there and the reason that it's not falling is because friction is holding it in place. But if we turn on the air then the weight of that falling mass produces a torque that will give that disc an angular acceleration. And to determine that angular acceleration, all we need to measure is the height that the mass falls through and the time it takes to fall through that height. Now I've got it set at 86 centimetres. That's 0 0.86 metres. And we're going to time how long it takes for the mass to fall. Here we go. We're going to let it go and start the stop clock at exactly the same moment. And then we'll stop the stop clock when it hits the floor. And we got a reading of 4.88 seconds. And we're going to repeat it another four times. And then find the mean time for it to hit the ground. And then the only other measurements we need are the radius of the pulley. Which has got a diameter of 5.5 centimetres. And we we'll measure the radius of the disc itself which is 15 centimetres. And now we've got all the measurements we need to work out the moment of inertia of the disc. So let's write down all our measurements first. So the mass of the hanging mass was 0.1 kilograms, it was 100 grams. The vertical distance it fell through was 0.86 metres. The radius of the pulley was 0 0.0275 metres, because it was half of the diameter. And the radius of the big disc itself was 15 centimetres. And remember, we repeated our measurements for it to fall through the 0.86 metres. And there are all five of the times that I measured. So the mean of those five is 5.04 seconds. And of course, we should work out the random uncertainty in that mean, just to get an indication of how confident we are with that measurement. And that works out to be about 1.4%. Now, if we want to determine the moment of inertia of the rotating disc, we're going to use the relationship tau equals I alpha, where tau is the applied torque in newton meters, and alpha is the angular acceleration in radians per second squared. Now, we are going to assume here that the torque is going to be provided by the weight of the falling mass times the radius of the pulley that the string was wound on. So let's sub our values in then for the weight and the radius. So it'll be mg times r. The mass was 0.1 kilograms and the radius 0 0.0275. And that gives us an answer for the applied torque of 0 0.027 newton meters. Remember we used a hanging mass of 100 grams and the pulley had a diameter of 5.5 centimetres, so its radius 2.75 centimetres. Now we need the angular acceleration as well, and we can work that out from the time it took for the mass to fall 0 0.86 metres. So that's a linear displacement, so we can work out its angular displacement from that. So theta is going to be equal to s over r, that's the 0.86 over the radius of the pulley. And that gives us an angular displacement of 31 radians. And then we can use our rotational equations of motion to work out alpha, 
We know it starts from rest, and the mean time was 5.04. And then using the appropriate rotational equation of motion, we can work out alpha. Now the initial angular velocity was zero, so omega naught t cancels out, and then we'll rearrange it for alpha. So two theta over t squared equals alpha, and then we can sub in for the values that we know. So alpha will be equal to two times 31, over 5.04 squared, and that gives us an angular acceleration of 2.4 radians per second squared. And now we have the torque, 0.027 newton meters, and the angular acceleration of 2.4 radians per second squared. We can work out the moment of inertia of the disk. So tau equals I alpha, therefore I will be equal to tau over alpha, and the torque was 0.027 and the angular acceleration was 2.4. And if you do that in your calculator, you will get an answer for the moment of inertia of the disk of 0 0.011 kilogram meters squared. Now, can we check this? Well, theoretically, the moment of inertia of a disk is a half mr squared, and the radius of our disk was 15 centimeters, or 0 0.15 meters. So the mass of the disk should be if we rearrange the moment of inertia relationship, then 2i over r squared should be equal to the mass. So let's sub in what we know. The moment of inertia was 0 0.011, and the radius of the disk was 0 0.15 meters. And don't forget to square that. And that gives us an expected mass of the disk of 0 0.98 kilograms, or 980 grams. Now our science technician informs me that he's put a sticker underneath the disc with its mass and its moment of inertia written on it. So, the rum roll please. Here's the sticker. The mass, 975 grams. Radius 15 centimetres, but more importantly, the moment of inertia, 0 0.011 kilogram meter squared. There you go then. But hold on, what about our assumptions? What did we assume here? Well, we assumed a couple of things. Firstly, that the weight of the falling mass is equal to the tension. Now, that will only be true when the mass was stationary. When it's accelerating downwards, the tension will be less than the weight. And in fact, the tension will be equal to the weight minus the unbalanced force that's making the mass accelerate. Now, we know what the weight is. The weight was 0.98 newtons. The falling mass had a mass of 0.1 kilograms. And we can work out the linear acceleration of the falling mass by using our linear equations of motion. So if we do a very quick s equals ut plus a half at squared and work out the acceleration of the falling mass, then that works out to be 0 0.07 meters per second squared. And if we sub that in, then it turns out the actual tension is 0.97 newtons, which is a difference of less than 1%, and we might be able to treat that as negligible. Now our second assumption is that the moment of inertia of the pulley and the rod was, was negligible. And again, we can do a rough calculation to see if that is the case. Now the mass of the pulley was 250 grams, and it's got a mean radius of well, let's use the 0 0.0275 that we used before. And therefore, its moment of inertia, if we consider it to be a disk, its moment of inertia works out to be 0 0.00009 kilogram meters squared. And so compared to the moment of inertia of the disk itself, then the pulley's moment of inertia is less than 1% of that of the disk. So we could consider that to be negligible. The biggest uncertainty in our answer of the moment of inertia of the disk is in our measured time. Remember, it was 1.4%. But when we used that time to work out the angular acceleration of the disk, then the time in that relationship was squared. And when you square the time, you should really double the uncertainty. So if the uncertainty in the time was 1.4%, and the uncertainty in t squared will be 2.8%. So approximately 3% then. So in conclusion, 
there's our moment of inertia of the disc, with a very rough uncertainty of about 3%. Now that might be the sort of procedure you do in your advanced higher physics project, although it would be much better to do it in a way where you could get a graph of your results and do an analysis of that graph, and of course a much more rigorous approach to your uncertainties. Anyway, there you go. Have a great day now, and we'll see you in the next one.